So yeah, it's 11 sharp, so we can start. Uh, hi everybody, nice to see the amount of people. So it's more than I've seen last two years on all my sessions. Usually we're just looking at my camera and monitor. So it's, again, public speaking issue. Uh, so welcome to my session, Power BI Good, Bad and Ugly. What's the session about? It's all the things from end-to-end -end in Power BI, where we do our mistake, where are the challenges, how to solve them. I will touch some of those, and uh, if you have any questions in the end, so we'll have time for questions. So first of all, thanks to all the sponsors, so from Microsoft sponsoring the event, and all the other companies making this possible. So gold sponsors, data quality sponsors, event lunch accessibility, and data analytics. So thanks to all of them once again. And about myself, so Augustin working as analytics uh, center of excellence director at Razio. We are world largest Amazon aggregator. Working with Power BI since probably private preview, even before that when we, Microsoft started developing it. Microsoft Certified Trainer and a leader of Power Platform User Group Stuttgart and Data Jazzers Podcast. So enough about me. Today topic, so you probably all seen this picture 100 times. And this is whoever is dealing with Power BI is doing it daily. And in each of those fields, is it data, is it sorting data, arranging data, visualizing data, we have some of the challenges. But even with, with Power BI, expanding further, months by months, we have additional things. So we need to know a little bit also about storytelling. And even that is not enough, so we need to make those things actionable, useful, because those times when we pull our data to Excel, put some plain table and uh, give it to whoever was requesting for it, is hopefully long gone, or it will be long gone soon, whenever we stop using Excel as much as we are doing it today. And agenda for today is covering these three places where we usually can create a problem or find some challenges. So data preparation, data modeling, and report design itself. And starting with data preparation, so the, that most boring, most challenging, and most time-consuming part of our report creation journey. And talking about that, we, although it's a purely technical work, so we need to know data, we need to know how to extract data, how to bring it to Power BI, how to do whatever we need to do with it, we need to start discussing with our customers, with our requesters, with our teams, so what's, what they are going to use their report for, what are the key metrics, and what level of details is really required. So based on answers on those questions, we can start preparing our data model, start pulling our data. Without asking those questions, we will end up with something we either don't want or will create us a mess afterwards. And that first thing is, give me everything. So whenever you talk to a regular business user, what data do you want to is everything. So it's like taking a child to a toy store. So whenever you took your kid to a toy store, what do you want to buy? Everything. And you start discussing with your kid, okay, you cannot have everything today. Maybe you pick one thing and next time you pick the other thing. Same thing goes with creating data models and reports with our users, because usually we see, sorry, we see something like this. So this is our database, and if, if we start pulling everything, we will end up in a mess. So first complaint would be, I have no idea what data did you pulled in. I, my report is slow. That's the second complaint. And all of this because we forgot what questions to ask and what do they really need. 
And when it, com when it comes to those questions, usually our users, end users, don't know the answer. And that's part of our job to help them, guide them through the data, and come up with the concrete results. And then we decided that we put some sense over the, over the data, and we put we explain them that not everything needs to be pulled in, not everything needs to be done. Then comes the first question. Is it import or is it direct query? And here I'm talking about direct query for relational databases, not, <coughs> sorry, not the new one for composite models, which is direct query for analysis services. And when you think of distinction between those two, like I did, I like analogies, and like with a kid in a toy store, here is the same story. So think of direct query as having a restaurant and having a kitchen and let all your customers in the kitchen to serve themselves. Soon you will have a mess there. Everybody will come creating their main dish, some will take a starters, and waiters and all the stuff in the kitchen will be furious and mad. Same thing with direct query. Those furious guys will be our database admins and will hit their database with, I don't know, 1,000 queries an hour, few thousand queries an hour. Our end users will complain that our report is super slow and only reason for that will be choosing direct query. And few questions to ask yourself. So is your relational database optimized for direct query? Talking to a database admin, SQL database admin, Snowflake, whoever you want to speak with, they will all claim that it's optimized, that it's working super fast. And you start connect direct query, start pulling your data, and your usual table with few thousand or hundreds of thousand rows is going to be slow. Why is it? It's by default, it's five to ten times slower even if the underlying database is optimized for querying like that. In some cases, 100 times slower. Check the details if you want to deep dive, technically deep dive, SQL BI, Marco and Alberto have a great articles about why is it slower what happening, but just imagine it. It's not first import mode is in memory. It's there, super fast. Even if you create your model correctly, it will be much, much faster. And on the other side, direct query needs to traverse through gateway, needs to execute on the underlying data source, needs to go back and then display it on your report. So by design, it will be slower. So if you are if you need to do it, you need to explain your users that comparing import mode versus direct query is going to be slower. And DAX limitations. So you cannot create calculated tables, you cannot use time intelligence. So all of those things which, is really, which are really helpful are not gonna be there. And when to use, so why Microsoft put it there? So there are cases when we will use it. And as far as I'm concerned, only two cases are there. One is databases, data needed is simply way too large to import it. Even that can be mitigated with some of the new features released in Power BI, but I'll not touch those today simply because I didn't have enough time to test it deeply. But let's say database is too large for import, and the other thing is you need real-time data. And real-time data is a buzzword each and every business user is using daily. And when you start deeper discussion about what are their real-time needs, usually you come up, we need it, I don't know, twice a day, every three hours, and that's not real-time, that's not why we need to use direct query. Real time, 
Use cases would be I really need to see metrics for some of the machines. I use IoT sensors and I need to see in real time to be able to fix it. That's real time data. Everything else, choose an import mode if you can. Then when we decided what we're going to do with our data, where is our data, comes our Power Query engine. And unfortunately, so the biggest problem with Power Query today, even if you know how to use it, is trying to Google it. Did you ever try Googling, give me M for this or this or this? And Google is usually returning really weird results. You need to write Power Query M, then you are maybe closer to results. And I still don't know why Microsoft choose an official M language, because it's impossible to Google about it. And there we have some additional challenges. So first thing, everybody asks where data shaping should be, uh, should be done. Is it in a source database? Is it in Power Query? And I think the most famous quote around it is from Matthew Roche from Microsoft CAD team. Everybody is using it, push the transformation upstream as possible. So if you can do it on your source database, even if you don't have access, be a friend with your database admin and do it there, then pull it from there. If you cannot do it, do it in Power Query. Doing it in DAX is usually comes with additional set of issues. So those are two places where I would be doing any data transformation, at least any that can be done there. Then we start doing our transformation. So there are more than 300 ways just from user interface perspective. If you dig deeper into M, you can do pretty much whatever you want to. And looking at whoever did anything in Power Query, if they didn't use uh, Direct Query, there are a lot of steps on the right-hand side. And those steps can be helpful, but at the same time can be completely misguiding if you don't know what you are doing. So try to apply all the similar actions within a single step. So I cannot describe you how many times I see, looking at those steps on the right-hand side, change type, rename, change type, rename, and so on and so on in the list like this. So if you really need the change type, and you, need, you know you need to do it 10 times in 10 different places, do it in a single step. If you need to do renaming, rename 10 columns in a single step, simply because Power Query is executing step by step, it will be slower. Your refresh time will be slower, and you will end up with something you don't want. And the other thing, when I'm finished with my report, if I'm a consultant, leave it at the company, somebody needs to take the maintenance later on. And if I have 200 steps on the right-hand side, probably somebody will hate me and never call me again because I didn't do my job properly. And then I think the problem everybody is either not aware of or don't know what is it, is so-called query folding. So query folding is nothing else than translating Power Query language to TSQL, which can be executed on a relational database side, which is supporting TSQL. So you are pushing your query on a source where it can be executed and it will be much faster, your refresh will be much faster if you are pushing query folding. Some things can be folded, some things not. So whatever, if you know TSQL and you know M, whatever you can think of, so if there is a, where, if, if there is a function in TSQL, it can be uh, folded. Some things that cannot be folded is, for example, loading from additional sources, loading a table from Excel, of course, I cannot translate it to TSQL. 
because it's Excel source. And one thing to remember there is whenever I break my query folding with some step which is not supported, it will not come back again. So if I have 10 steps and first and fifth step are foldable, but in between I did some things which are not. So for example, I think changing a data type is not foldable. If I break it, it will not come back again. So being aware of that, you can speed up your performance of your refresh significantly if you push all the foldable steps to the beginning. And if you know that you will break it in one point in time, put all the rest afterwards. So at least part of your refresh, part of your query will be folded and executed on the database side. And then we did all our job around picking direct query or import mode, deciding with users what data do they need, doing some transformations in Power Query, and then the most fun part is data modeling. What models should we use? So I would always pick this one probably, simply because it's fastest. So I take my table, put it in, do some quick pie chart, and display it to an end user. And I'm doing that once, twice, and usually it doesn't end up well. So I need to do something with it. And Power BI is simply optimized for dimensional modeling. Star schema is something what Power BI is aimed for. So looking at something like this, which is usually our plain Excel table, some user get us, we want to have some fancy visuals. So we can import it like this, or we can take a closer look and see that we have some dates here, we have some customers, we have some products and some values. So grouping all of those, splitting them, we will end up with something like this. Your end user would have no idea about the difference, but will feel it in performance. And you will be happy later on because you will be able to use time intelligence functions. Because I don't know, did any of you try to write time intelligence function on a flat table? So, for example, year to date. It, in time intelligence in DAX, year to date is one line of code or two, the most. If you write, are writing it on a flat table, I think 10 or 12. So three times more, just because you saved your time and you imported a flat table, not creating a dimensional model. Also be aware of relationships. So whoever has some background in dimensional modeling, read some books, knows about dimensions in fact, the next thing we need to be careful is our relationships. So like a best practice scenario, so whenever you can, you do it. One too many relationships with a single filtering direction. Everything else, of course, you can do it. So in Power BI, you can do one to one, one to many, many to many with a single direction and bidirectional filtering. If you are not 100, 110% sure what you are doing, you can end up with really weird results. And you will spend hours, if not days, trying to figure out what happened. Speaking from my personal experience, debugging some of the big models, you see a weird number, you are 100% sure number is not correct. Finding what happened usually comes to bidirectional relationship because you created ambiguity in a model and depending from which side of a model you are coming, you will get a different number. So having said that, so if you know what you are doing, it's okay, but I 
would never be, never be sure that my bidirectional relationship will support me forever. Because somebody, months from when you deliver it, will add a new table in, create some additional relationship, and your model will start acting weirdly. So keep, keep that in mind whenever you are modeling. Next thing is snowflaking. So of course, Power BI is supporting snowflake things, so adding additional flakes on our star schema. It's working, it's doable, it's perfectly fine. If you can avoid it, avoid it. So especially in the cases like this, when you have product category and product separated, if there is no real use case to use it, try to put it together. So why? Because each and every additional relationship is creating complexity of your model and not to dig, dig deeper into ducks and concept of expanded tables, but creating a snowflake will, each and every of your queries need to traver traverse to additional relationship, which will slow it down and increase the size of your model. Sometimes you cannot avoid it, but keep it in mind. And then, the beauty of Power BI is DAX. So, we did everything good. Loaded, imported our data, put perfect star schema, and then we need to start writing some functions. And whoever is new to DAX, it can be super intuitive and super easy in the beginning. Looks most like Excel in the beginning. It's, you know, you are, your language itself is readable, easy, but comes with a set of complexities and set of problems which are unfortunately not solvable but by, by trial and error. You will probably get to a correct result, but you will need some foundations to know what DAX is doing. And I'm just listing here just a few things for people who just entered DAX world or working partially with DAX. Some things which can cause us performance troubles and can be easily avoided. So first, search function. So everybody is used to something like that from uh, Excel. We are always searching for something in Excel in the strings. And Search function is really expensive in DAX. So it's first case sensitive and needs to traverse all the rows. And as it's case sensitive, it can take a long time, especially if you have a big tables. The next best, best thing to use is find. So pretty much you will end up with the same thing, but find is a little bit more optimized doing the same thing. The problem in DAX is you can use the third thing, contain string. And you can use contain string exact. All of this will almost come to the same result, almost, simply because so. Instead of search, you can use contain string. Instead of find, you can use contain string exact. The only difference will be the result, which will be in both, in two first cases, one or zero. Uh, in second ca two cases will be true or false. But pretty much with some handling, you will end up with the same result. Only thing is these two are much more optimized in engine behind us and will give you results faster. Then, usual error coming from Excel is using something like this. Searching for an errors, dividing something and returning blank if there is an error, why we are doing this for handling division by zero. Everybody is using it in Excel. It's perfectly fine function. Problem with it, it's super slow. You can do the same thing in DAX 
and with a sorry, few sentences less, doing a division, divide, and divide has a built-in error handling inside, so you don't need to write it separately with if error and then returning blank when error is there. So those, and again, you will get the same result. So those are the basic things you need to think of when uh, starting with DAX. Coming to some bit more, just a little bit more advanced things are virtual relationships. So I talked about relationships on previous slide. We can create active relationships and we can create inactive relationships. Inactive relationship is not recognized by a function if you not use if you don't use some of the functions that will utilize that relationship. And uh, most of the people coming from any other language, starting with ducks, will search around web, will end up with something like this. Trying to do some calculation and then searching for values in product table that will enable them to do that calculation. And this thing uses contains, which is, will do the job. Of course, you will end up with utilizing that virtual relationship, but it will be super expensive regarding performance. You can do the same thing with intersect. So again, just talking about utilizing relationships which are not active. So, with intersect, you will save yourself a few lines of code. Pretty much everything else is almost the same, but the function is a little bit more optimized regarding performance. And then the beauty of DAX, we have the third thing. Treat as, so again, saving a single line of code comparing to intersect, we don't need this all. end up with the same result. So whenever you are, if you are new to Power BI, new to DAX, so there are almost always multiple ways to achieve the same results. And those ways can cost you either performance, either troubling modeling, and just be aware that if something is slow, probably there is a way to optimize it, either on the modeling side, either just rewriting your docs using some functions which are more optimized. Unfortunately, some of the functions are coming, are not, if you are in docs for many years, Treatess is pretty new and I think it requires analysis services compatibility level 1,500. So if you have old on-prem environment, you will probably not be able to use treat as. You will still be with contains and intersect. So going from top, then here, slowest one, a bit better, fastest one. Of course, depending how big is your model, if I'm trying to create a virtual relationship between two tables, each containing a few hundred million rows, nothing will be super fast but it will be a bit faster using three tests than contains. For the same thing, same result. Then, my favorite part of DAX, filtering. So we use it daily, we can filter tables, filter columns, filtering some values, doing keep filters, so bunch of things that we can do. And I'll do some short demo, just to show you the simple thing that Power BI, not this, this, that Power BI can do. So, yeah. So we have, do you see it, see it? Are the numbers big enough? Yeah. 
So we have a simple table, simple data model, simple table where we have countries, some total revenue by, by country. And looking at the model itself, it's pretty straightforward. So simple model, geography, product, uh, manufacturer, my sales fact table. This is actually model reused from dashboard in a day uh, from Microsoft. So it's pretty easy. And usually when we have something like this, the first question comes from somewhere. Okay, I want to filter it just for something. I want to see my total revenue by Scotland in this example. And first thing I will do is create a measure. So this is what most of the people will write starting with ducks and it's perfectly fine. So calculate my total revenue where my country name equals Scotland. And when I put that in my visual, I will end up with this. Do I need these results? Maybe not, maybe yes. So this is useful when I want to create some uh, ratios, when I want to divide total revenue comparing to Scottish revenue to create some... Uh, but usually when I present something like this to my end customer, they will have a question mark above their head. So what is this? I know that Germany is not having 700,000, it's having 65 millions, and so on and so on. And what is DAX actually doing in a backend? So this, what we written is just a short thing of something like this. So Power BI did in a backend, so I can write this down by myself, or Power BI is translating my first function to this, is utilizing filter and telling my calculate function that I need to filter my country name and first remove all the outer filters from my country name column and then find where my country is Scotland. And because of calculate, I will not deep dive into context transition and everything, because of calculate is overriding all the outer filters and replacing it with inner filter, I will end up with result like this. And it's, as I said, it's not bad. So when I use this second function and use it here, same thing. So both are doing pretty much the same thing. Difference is the one here is actually what I'm writing. The second one is what DAX engine, so VertiPak engine in the backend is translating it to. So same function. And still my result is not good. Then whoever is new to DAX will write something like this. Okay, I know what to do. I will remove that all and filter my table. Do you know what's the problem with this? So anybody more proficient with DAX, can you spot a problem here? It will work perfectly fine. The result will be exactly what I'm looking for. But it's working perfectly fine. Here in this example, in this small data model, it's super fast. But the biggest problem here is this geography. So what I'm doing is filtering entire table, geography table, to find my country name which is in a single column. So if I look at that table, geography, I have three, six, nine, eleven 11 columns. And when I'm in this dimension table, I just have 10, 12 rows. It's super fast. Imagine in my current company, we have a product dimension with, I think, 10 and a half million rows. It's a dimension. Imagine putting entire table with all the columns in my filter and expecting it to be super fast. It will not happen. So this is usually a common mistake 
lots of people are doing, and uh, how can I avoid it is with something like this. First, to use just the column I need. If I don't need entire table, don't use entire table. And the second thing, I can write this without values. What it will do if I'm scanning a fact table which doesn't have a unique values, it will take everything into consideration. With values, it will just give me unique values of that column, so data set which I'm filtering over will be much smaller and it will be much faster. And this is, again, returning me a perfectly fine number. So you see now one, two, three, four possibilities of returning the same thing again. Then we, we did everything great, but there is fifth possibility, which will be the fastest one. And this is with keep filters. So keep filters is a function, so I will not dig deep dive. If you, I think, two days back, SQL BI released a great article explaining backend nature of keep filters and what is it doing and why is it doing. But in this use case I'm showing here, this will be the fastest, most optimized function, and it will work in most of the scenarios where some of the others might not work. And it look like, looks like this. So I don't need... So comparing to the previous one, one line of code less, I'm just using keep filters. What is it saying to my calculate function, to my DAX, is watch all the filters coming from my table. So filters coming from my table are this. Watch them all. They are all perfectly fine. Let them stay there. Whenever you find Scotland in country name, intersect this, those outer filters and keep that value. And it will be much faster than any of the previous and will give you, again, the same result. So simple thing is filtering can be done in DAX multiple ways. And if you are not aware of it, please keep it in mind so you can have a lot of performance issues. Now going back to my slides. We come, so going we are here, okay, going here. We did all of our docs, everything is working perfectly fine. Now we need to actually do the only thing the end user will see, our design of, design of our report. And also that's a place where we can screw things up and not make it fast enough. So keep in mind that our brain is, and our eyes is pretty much our most effective remembering sensor. And when I see picture, comparing to sound or speech, immediate recall is a bit more on the side of picture than uh, on what I'm saying at the moment. The problem comes after three days, most of you, 90% of you, will forget every single word what I was speaking today, but maybe a bit more than half of you will remember some of the pictures from my slides. So keep that in mind if, when you are start designing your reports. And then we come with the first problems there. Poor cho choice of our charts. And as I said in the beginning, this is the most favorite chart of all time. So can anybody tell me what's the third best selling product? Disregard all the other problems we have <laughs> in this chart. So I have no idea. So I forgot because I created this. I don't know, is it this one or maybe this one or this one? So you see the biggest problem immediately. So 
pie charts, donut charts. Great, so I love pies and I love donuts, but not on the charts. There are many, if you look at the Twitter, try to Google pie chart or donut chart, you will see a lot of fights and uh, pros and cons and everything. But please, 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 my ask for you is simply don't use it. So if Microsoft is not listening to us and not removing it from all the products overall, let's not use it because if you have more than three values, it will not be readable. But even if you have three values, and those are, I don't know, 33, 32, 33, it's not usable. The second problem is context. So context is king. I have my cards in Power BI. They are great. So I have my sales, volume, margin, number of customers, everything. But what does this number actually mean? Think of giving as much context as you can in the less space as you can. So same cards, same amount of space. I provided amount of, huge amount of context in the same space. I provide the color immediately, meaning if it's green, probably it's good, it's better than whatever I'm comparing it uh, to. I know what I'm comparing it to, and I see the difference. I can even add additional things there, but try to provide a, as much context, because space on Power BI Canvas is limited. Of course, you can extend it right and left, but then you comes to poor user experience in scrolling up and down, left and right, it's not good. Use your space wisely and provide as much context as you can. Next, something like this. I have all my products, all my years, put everything on my chart, and what's the difference between product six and 12 in 2009, January, I have no idea. And delivering something like this is completely useless, same as delivering huge uh, reporting services reports with printable 20, 250 pages with numbers. Same thing is here, just on a smaller space. And we are saving planet because not printing, but usability is completely the same. So try to avoid this. Same thing comes with this, so slicers. They are great, they are super fine, but if you put 10 of those with everything, so user ID, ID, opportunity, account owner ID, and hundred thousands of rows in each and every slicer, all you will do with a report is waiting for it to be refreshed. So nothing else. So whenever you, it's refreshed, you will see the number and say, okay, I need a, some additional slicer. You will click it, go grab a coffee, come back, maybe it's done. If you are using slicers, use them wisely because having a slicer with 10,000 rows inside is not going to be useful for anybody. Or at least if you need to do it, put a search. So maybe I'm a bit faster. And the last thing is this. So this is super nice with a dozen of problems regarding performance, regarding usability, regarding everything. First, performance. Unfortunately, Power BI engine for rendering visuals is a single-threaded engine. So each and every visual is waiting for the previous one to be displayed, to be able to display it. If you have probably 30 of those here, you need to wait for 30 visuals to be rendered. And if you next to that have a complex duck queries inside, low time of this page will be horror. That's the first problem, so it will not be performant. The second problem is usage of colors. So accessibility, color blindness, everything, that's one part of the problem. I'm not, I'm not uh, any expert in that, but you see it immediately. The next problem regarding UI is inconsist inconsistent usage of colors. So I have my black here, 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 and each and every of those blacks is meaning different thing. So 
I cannot spot immediately my patterns, I cannot spot immediately group things together in my uh, head and everything. And then charts like this. So this is another way for donut chart. So just uh, with a square, I don't know how to call it. I call it a chocolate chart because it's sliced like a chocolate. Usability is pretty much the same as a pie chart. So that's all the things you need to be careful of when you are delivering a report. And I just, with this session, I just scratched the surface, actually. There are a tons of challenges waiting you on your journey to deliver your first or your hundredth report. And most of those, those challenges are grouped in these places I discussed about. And hopefully, I managed to at least raise some questions in your head, if not answer some of the questions you had. And that's it from my side. So any questions? Of course. So whenever, on first question, query folding, so the only thing I would say about query folding is just be aware of it. So if something, if I can bring my Excel to my underlying database and uh, do it on schedule, because usual use cases, our finance department is doing budgeting in Excel. And they have no idea how to write it in a SQL table or what to do it. Yes, we can take that Excel, create a SIS package, pull it to our table. Query will be foldable for that case. But in some cases, you cannot. Just be aware of it. So if you need it, push it to the end of your query list just to save some time. And regarding your second question, snowflaking, so there is no good or bad option there. So whoever is coming from data warehousing world, the data modeling, Snowflake is perfectly fine. With Power BI, which is completely optimized for star schemas, you will pay some performance penalties. So each and every additional relationship my query needs to go through will add some execution time and slower some performance. Of course, complex data models, you cannot avoid it. And just be aware of it. If performance is a bit slower when you add additional table, you need to know why, maybe you cannot optimize it, but at least know the optimization of uh, Power BI engine itself. Yep. Same as me. I wouldn't. So there is, that's, a, that's a struggle I'm doing daily at my, at my job. So we have, in my company, we have huge data warehouse team. We have a big few hundred terabytes of data warehouse on the Snowflake. It's working perfectly fine. When I need specific, for example, finance department data model. If I'm creating a small data mart on a Snowflake, and try to import it again, I will end up either with a flat table or I need to model it again in Power BI. Right. So comparing to traditional world well, we, where we build dozens of data marts on top of our warehouse, yeah. the only difference is I can now do it in Power BI. Okay. So I'm not changing a concept, just changing a tool. So would I? Sorry. Mm -hmm. The only real way I can see doing that is to bring them into a single database or journal. And then I could look at the Power BI specification of the Power Of course, but on the other side, 
not going uh, deeper into details because it's it's really ongoing discussion, but I can... The m thing I'm struggling the most with is Power BI is still recognized on the market like a visualization tool. Yeah. With all the capabilities it currently has, Microsoft itself is voting for Power BI as an end-to-end BI tool. Yeah. I can really now, with especially with current capabilities coming from last few weeks, I can build my complete data warehouse called Data Marts in Power BI, yeah. build a data model on top of it, create some data flows behind looking at them as SIS packages, and display it in Power BI. So it's really end-to-end -end product now. How would you combine it with your existing infrastructure is architectural decision each and every company needs to make, and it can be completely a separate session. Yeah. Any other question? No? Then thank you all for listening and being here. <laughs> <laughs>